Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be with you this morning today, worshiping the Lord and opening up His Word. If you don't know who I am, I am Robert Bishop's black sheep older brother. Uh, No, my name is Alan Holtberg. I'm an elder here at church uh, and a professor at, uh, at Biola University in New Testament. And it is my pleasure to, uh, to speak to you this morning. Now, in the first service, Vance Nordine was here. He's a real estate agent. Uh, I wonder, are there any real estate agents here this morning? If, if you're a real estate agent, raise your hand. All right, so it looks like Vance's office is where everybody in the church needs to go uh, if you're selling a house or buying a house. But when a real estate agent is selling a house that is structurally sound, but it needs a facelift, what do they say about the house? What do they tell the client? The house has good bones, right? The house has good bones. It's fundamentally sound, uh, even though there's a lot of work to be done on the house. Maybe it needs new carpet, or it needs new paint, or uh, the appliances need to be upgraded, or the, uh, the bathroom or the kitchen needs to be remodeled. Whoever buys the place is going to have to tear out a lot of stuff, tear it down to the bones, but it's going to be recreated into a new, modern, uh, more functional place to live. In today's passage, we're going to see that God is the ultimate real estate agent, or perhaps the ultimate house flipper. God is going to tear this world down to its bones, and he's going to remodel it into something brand new. And the question that we will want to think about today is what our part in that process is going to be. Will you, will I live in that new house or not? Now, we're going to be looking at a brief passage in Hebrews chapter 12. We're continuing our our series in Hebrews. So, turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and follow along as I begin reading in verse 25. The author of Hebrews writes, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more, and I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now, this passage is a continuation of the passage that Robert preached on last week, uh, verses 18 through 24 of Hebrews 12. And if you were here, you'll remember that in Hebrews 12, 18 to 24, the author contrasted two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And they represent two covenants that the author of Hebrews has been um, comparing throughout the book of Hebrews up through uh, chapter 10. The old covenant and the new covenant. Mount Sinai is where Israel met God to enter into the old covenant with him, the Mosaic covenant. Okay? Uh, it was stipulated by the laws of the Old Testament. And when God came down to Mount Sinai, you remember no one was able to touch the mountain for fear of being killed. Uh, there were these incredible, powerful phenomena uh, that appeared when God came down to Mount Sinai. There was uh, lightning and thunder and fire and smoke and a trumpet blast and a great earthquake. And the terror was so great. God's voice was so awesome that 
the people of Israel begged not to have to listen to the voice of God. They begged that only Moses would be able to hear the voice of God. They were going to stand far away and they were going to wait for Moses to come down from the mountain. That was the experience of those who entered into the old covenant with God, a covenant that the author of Hebrews has been arguing uh, has been superseded by the new covenant, the covenant that's offered in the good news, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's Son. So the other mountain in uh, verses 18 to 24 is Mount Zion, the place where God's temple is. But the Mount Zion that the author is speaking about is not uh, the heavenly, I mean the earthly mountain, but the one in heaven. It isn't the earthly temple that represents God's presence among his people. It's the heavenly temple where God's presence actually dwells. It's as the author of Hebrews calls it, the new Jerusalem, the place where God and his people are going to live together forever. This is the place that the author of Hebrews has been arguing Jesus gives us access to in the new covenant. So in Hebrews 18, uh, 12, 18 to 24, the author says that his readers have been brought near to this heavenly mountain. They're standing at the base of this mountain, and they have to make a choice. And that brings us then to the passage that we're going to be looking at today. Notice what the author says in verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Now, you remember the story of the Exodus in the Old Testament. That's this story of the Israelites coming to Mount Zion. You remember how that story goes, right? First, uh, God called Moses to go to the Egyptian Pharaoh and tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And at first, Pharaoh refused But then God sent a series of uh, ten plagues or ten judgments. And so Pharaoh finally relented. And the people of Israel began to leave Egypt en masse. But then Pharaoh changed his mind, right? And he sent his army uh, to pursue the fleeing Israelites. And so the people cried out for help. They were at the edge of the Red Sea. And the army was approaching. And God made a way for them across the Red Sea. And then he destroyed the army of Pharaoh. And then God led Israel to Mount Sinai, where again he appeared in fire and smoke and lightning and thunder. And he entered into a covenant with the nation. But as I said, the the people were too afraid of the powerful voice of God, of the presence of God, and they begged not to have to uh, hear him but to have Moses mediate for them instead. So the author of Hebrews says in verse 25 that the people of Israel refused him who spoke to them on earth. And in fact, as the story goes, they continued to refuse to listen to God's voice, right? They refused to trust and obey God as he led them through the wilderness to the promised land. So do you remember what happened when they got to Kadesh Barnea, right? They're on the very threshold of entering the land that God had promised to give them. He, they, they, they sent in 12 spies to find out whether the land really was worth going to, right? And those spies came back. They brought some of the produce from the land. They said, yeah, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. This is a, a, a good land. This is a choice land. This is... This is Uh, everything that God uh, said it was going to be. But then 10 of the spies also said, but the people who live in this land are fierce warriors. These people are giants. We uh, appeared as grasshoppers to them. If we go into this land, we're going to get wiped out, right? Uh, Their cities are impregnable. 
we're going to be destroyed. And the people of Israel freaked out. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, were optimistic. They told the people to have faith in God. They told the people they needed to, to trust the God who had led them out of Egypt and destroyed Pharaoh's army and sustained them in the wilderness. Uh, they told the people that they needed to have faith in the God who had promised to give them this land. And so what did the people of Israel do? Do you remember? They took a vote and they decided to get rid of Moses and Joshua and Caleb and to go back to Egypt. God had spoken and they had refused to listen to his voice. And you know what happened next, right? We read about it in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 where the author is reflecting on Psalm 95 which also recounts these events. It says, So God swore in his wrath that that faithless generation would wander in the wilderness until they were all dead. They would not be allowed to enter the promised land. Only their children would be allowed to enter. So, our author in Hebrews says to his readers, you guys aren't standing at Mount Sinai ready to accept the old covenant. You're standing at Mount Zion ready to accept the new covenant. See to it that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if those Israelites did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth at Mount Sinai, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. If we turn away from the one who has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ, the very image of the invisible God and the final revelation of God as uh, Hebrews 1 told us. If we turn away from the one who has spoken to us through his son, we'll be lost, we'll be destroyed. In the gospel proclamation, <clears throat> the good news that God has begun to make all things right through the coming of his Messiah, his anointed king. The proclamation that we can be reconciled to God and experience the blessings of the new covenant because of the sacrificial death of God's son, Jesus, and because of his resurrection and exaltation. In that proclamation, God is speaking to us from heaven. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Respond in faith to the gospel. That's what the author of Hebrews is, is telling us. Acknowledge that Jesus is who he says he is, God's son and king. And that his death paid the penalty for your sin. And that he rose from the dead as Lord of the universe. And that by acknowledging this and bowing the knee to Jesus, repudiating your rebellion against God, and submitting to his rightful claim of lordship in your life, you will be saved. You will enter into that new covenant relationship. And that's an incredible relationship. First of all, like I said, it means the forgiveness of your sins. God's wrath will not rest upon you. It also means that the Spirit of God will inhabit your life. God's presence will be with you. Uh, he'll lead you. He'll grow you into the sort of person that he intended you to be. It means that as the author of Hebrews said in, in uh, chapter 4, we can come boldly before the throne of grace in time of need. But even more, it means that you will inherit the perfect, remodeled house, the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation, where God's presence dwells and will, where you will live with him 
forever. So take a look again at verses 26 and 27 in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more, and I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. God's voice shook the earth at Mount Sinai, but in the future, at the end of the age, God's voice will shake all of creation to the extent that the, the old, temporal, fallen structures of this age will be done away with, and only the permanent foundation of creation will remain. God is going to tear this creation down to the bones and totally remodel it. He's going to make a new creation. Now, <clears throat> this idea of the new creation uh, requires a little bit of explanation because the relationship between the old creation and the new creation is a little bit ambiguous in, in Scripture. In one sense, there is a, a discontinuity between the old creation and the new creation. Turn, turn for a second to uh, 2 Peter, whoops, chapter 3, and uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 3. 2 Peter's uh, 3 is just a few pages down the road from Hebrews 12. 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 3. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintained this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And if you jump down to verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away uh, with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. And then verse 12. So we're looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So according to this passage, it seems like the old creation is going to be completely destroyed and replaced by a totally new, uh, different creation. And Revelation 21 leaves a similar impression. Um, right before the description of the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21, it says, the first heaven... And the first earth passed away. But according to Hebrews 12, our passage, it isn't quite the case that there will be a complete discontinuity between the old creation, this creation, and the new creation. Okay? And that makes sense theologically. That's important theologically. You see... There's something fundamentally good about this creation. And that good stuff, whatever that stuff is, the bones, okay, that stuff's going to remain, the author of Hebrews says. And this is appropriate because you remember when God first created, he looked at what he had made and he declared that it was good, right? That it was good. And in fact, it says in Genesis chapter 2, when God finished creation, he looked at all that he had made and he declared it was very good. Okay? This 
goodness of creation and the continuity of the old creation and the new creation. This, this is important. It's the reason why the resurrection of our bodies is so important to our salvation. You see, according to the Bible, our salvation isn't complete when we turn to Christ in faith and are reconciled to God. Our salvation is complete when our bodies are raised from the dead. And that's because we were not created merely as spirits. Okay? We were created as embodied spirits. Having a body tied to this physical creation is essential to who we are as human beings. We uh, were created as human beings to rule over this creation on behalf of God. We weren't created like the angels. The angels are God's spirit servants, okay? They are pure spirits. They were created to dwell in heaven, uh, to serve and worship God in heaven. We were created as God's enfleshed servants. We were created to dwell in this physical universe and serve and worship God here. That's why God is not going to just destroy this physical universe uh, and have us live for eternity in heaven with him. You know, the old picture sitting on clouds and strumming harps, right? He's going to remodel creation, uh, a creation in which we, in our resurrected and glorified bodies, will dwell and carry out our human responsibilities forever. And yet, the Bible tells us, the new creation will far exceed this first creation, even as our resurrection bodies will far exceed our present mortal bodies, according to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of information about what the new creation is going to be like, but it does give us some idea. So first, the Bible describes the new heavens and the new earth as a place of total peace, a place of total harmony or total shalom. All the good, harmonious relationships that God created in the beginning, the relationship between God and humanity, the relationship between one human being and another human being, the relationship between humanity and, and nature and creation. All those were, were harmonious relationships when first created. That's the way creation was intended to function. In the fall, when Adam and Eve chose to be like God, those relationships were destroyed. Those relationships were, were messed up. And so... When God creates the new creation, the Bible tells us, those creationships will be reestablished. Harmony will be restored. And so, you remember how Isaiah puts it, the lion will lie down with the lamb, right? Uh, the child will play on the adder's den. The, crea the, the relationship between humanity and creation is at peace again. He says... Uh, Humanity, people, are going to uh, 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 beat their swords into pl plowshares, right? They're going to learn no war no more. So the relationship between one person and another person is going to be reestablished in, in a harmonious way. And he says, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. The relationship between humanity and God is going to be restored. John tells us in the book of Revelation that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any crying or mourning or pain for the former things have passed away. The new creation will be a place of perfect relational 
and emotional peace. Second, the Bible depicts the new heavens and the new earth as the place where God will dwell with his people forever, where in the picture of Revelation 21, heaven comes down to earth. In Revelation 21, John sees the new Jerusalem, okay, which is an image of the new creation, coming down out of heaven from God. And he hears a voice say, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God will be God with them. In the new heavens, we will dwell in open, personal intimacy with God. We will have direct, face-to-face experience of God's love and grace and beauty and glory forever. And then finally, we're told that in the new creation, redeemed humanity will live out forever in perfection its role as God's representative rulers on earth. Remember that when God created humanity, Genesis uh, 1, 26 to 28, he told them, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and everything that walks on uh, the ground. We were created to rule over creation on behalf of God. We were created to function in this world as God's uh, vice regents. Okay? That's partly what it means that we were made in the image of God. We were made to represent God's rule in this world. And in the new creation, according to Revelation 22, that's exactly what we are going to do. Uh, if you want, you don't have to, but if you want, turn over to Revelation 22. In the, at the very end of John's description of the new Jerusalem, the new creation, um, he has these words to say, starting in verse uh, 3, Revelation 22, 3. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light or of a lamp or nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them. And then notice the very last statement about the new creation. And they, redeemed humanity, and they will reign forever and ever. In the new creation, the unshakable kingdom, as the author of Hebrews puts it, our lives will finally fulfill the purpose for which God made us. We will finally function as God intended, as his vice regents, as complete and perfect human beings. Well, that's the new creation. But I would be remiss if I didn't say something about the opposite, about what happens to those who don't inherit the new heavens and the earth. I need to say something about hell. The depictions of hell in the Bible are of a place of terrible torture. Hell is depicted as a fire that never burns out. It's depicted as a place of, of agony and of pitch darkness. Life in hell will be torment. But I think that sometimes we get the wrong impression of, of what that means. We, we often think of hell primarily as a place where, where a vindictive God will send people to be actively punished for all eternity for their bad deeds. A place where God will send people for, not to be too crass, an eternal spanking or something like that. Okay? But I think uh, there's another side to that. Certainly, uh, God's 
judgment will fall upon people in hell. But it's not that this vindictive God sends you there to be punished. And I'm speculating a little bit when I say this, but I, I believe the Bible uh, informs this speculation. Hell isn't a place that is first and foremost where God sends you because of his vindictiveness. It's a place that God allows you to go because you choose it. Okay, now let me tell you what I mean. If people choose to live independently of God, they want to be God, even though it breaks God's heart, he allows them to do so forever. Hell is an existence without the presence of God. You see, in our world, we experience life and love and joy and beauty and fulfillment, goodness, because of God's presence and grace in this world. But hell is a place where God's presence and grace have been withdrawn. A world without God is a world without life and beauty and joy and fulfillment and love. It's a world, ultimately, of emotional darkness and mental anguish. It's a world where you are forever consumed with your own self-will. People will go to hell because they chose it for themselves because they didn't want God in their lives. They wanted to be God, and God lets them. The problem is, they're not really God, right? And a life devoid of the true God is a shrunken, lonely, terrible, tormented life. It's a life you do not want to experience. So the author of Hebrews says that God is going to remodel his house. He's going to get rid of the old furniture, the old fixtures, the old carpet, and he's going to get rid of the squatters who have been living in his house. He's going to let his kids live there instead. And so the author says God is offering an eternal glorious life, the most fulfilling life ever in the new heavens and the new earth. But you can only live there under the lordship of Christ. If you refuse Christ, you'll be treated like squatters and you will be taken away with the old furniture and fixtures and carpet. And your next home will be unspeakably horrible. But if you respond to him who is speaking, you'll be treated like an heir. You'll move into the new house, and you will live there forever with the owner, your father, enjoying uh, its delights and uh, enjoying his loving relationship without end. So where does that leave us? Well, it seems pretty obvious that we have a decision before us. Are we going to refuse him who is calling from heaven, or are we going to respond to that call in the gospel? If you haven't yet put your trust in the work of Christ on your behalf at the cross, if you haven't yet acknowledged your rebellion against God, and your need of a Savior, and your willingness to repudiate your own autonomy and acknowledge Jesus as the rightful Lord of your life, you need to do that today. All you have to do is talk to him about that. Just tell him that you realize your life has been create, uh, centered around your will and not his will, uh, that you have rightfully incurred his condemnation 
Tell him that you believe that Jesus died for your sins, for your willful rebellion against God, and that he is your only true Lord. If you do, you can look forward to an eternity in the new creation. And you can do that right now while I'm talking. Uh, you can tune me out and tune him in and talk to him about that. Or you can meet with me after the service and I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Now, if you've already made that decision, and I know that uh, most of us here have, then the author of Hebrews has a different application for you. Take a look at Hebrews uh, 12, 28. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12 to our passage here, and, and I'll read verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So if you have already responded in faith to the good news of God's kingdom in Christ, then let gratitude for your salvation and reverence for God lead you to a, a life of service to Him. Work, working for, for His goals in this world, uh, living for uh, His values in the world, um, living out His virtues in this world. Now, that's something that the author of Hebrews is going to develop in chapter 13. He's going to explain a little bit more about what he means for us to live a life of reverence and awe before God. And so, uh, I don't want to go into detail about that this week. But I would recommend then, for those of you who have made a commitment to Christ, spend this week reading Hebrews chapter 13 and start to think about and to pray about uh, how your gratitude for the salvation that you have been granted should play itself out more fully in the coming days. In the language of John the Baptist, think about where you may need to decrease and God and his will increase in your life. Okay? So let me just close with this word. God is going to remodel his house into everything it was always intended to be. And he's going to let his children live there and enjoy it with him forever. Make sure today that you're going to be there. Amen.